as uh, some people who are talking about basically China replacing the United States uh, in the region or pushing the US uh, out of the region, whatever. It's not about China pushing somebody out. It's about China feeling a vacuum already right. created there. So this is important. Uh, I don't remember the exact uh, person, but there was a quote I remember from the time I was working on my PhD, actually, uh, from a Chinese official saying that, you know, basically, uh, wherever the United States marches forward, we go a little bit back. But whenever uh, they go back, we will go ahead. So it's a very calculated approach. And for China, it's like, you know, they see the need uh, of those countries on the one hand, mm -hmm. and also they see the need for stability in the region. Uh, so any sort of uh, tension, conflict between Iran and Saudi Arabia would be detrimental to uh, uh, China's uh, interest. Just imagine if uh, Iran's threat of uh, closing the Strait of Hormuz, for example, is going to be materialized. Who's going to be uh, damaged the most? It's, it's China, it's not Europe, right. it's not uh, the United States, it's China. Uh, so in that sense, China has its own interests in making peace between Iran and Saudi Arabia. And of course, those two countries, uh, because Iran has been um, kind of uh, considering China as a long term alternative uh, for for the West after all these disappointments with uh, in, in its relationship with the West. And Saudi Arabia, as I mentioned, in the uh, context of its uh, sort of uh, balanced foreign policy. So it's all about uh, regional actors. Uh, trying to adapt themselves to the changing realities of the international politics. And China, as uh, the uh, kind of uh, rising power, uh, trying to secure its interests and also uh, expand its influence uh, wherever possible. Uh, so I still don't see this as a sort of uh, a sign of a new... Uh, rivalry between uh, China and the United States, there is still no sign that, uh, at least in the short term, that uh, China will uh, become a kind of uh, the go-to uh, party, actually, for uh, all different uh, sorts of uh, conflicts of the region. This is something Chinese have been uh, wishing for, maybe, because they also proposed, uh, it was actually two years ago, uh, almost, uh, that China proposed the uh, formation of a regional forum uh, with the participation of all regional countries. And all regional countries also means Israel, whose existence right. uh, Iran uh, doesn't uh, accept. Uh, so in that sense, China is also in a learning process in, in the Middle East. And with all these uh, sort of uh, nuances and uh, delicate matters there, and uh, maybe a comparison would help because I, I clearly remember in 2015 when the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear uh, agreement was signed, uh, the Chinese uh, foreign minister was not even there when uh, the uh, agreement was announced. So he left. And uh, because, you know, China was there as just having the formal status uh, in the UN Security Council. But one cannot imagine such a thing uh, right now. Uh, we are uh, seeing a new China and, of course, also uh, a new region. So it's a trend. It's uh, Nothing has uh, fixed yet, and it also depends on uh, the extent to which the United States wants or is able to uh, meet the expectations of its partners, like uh, like Saudi Arabia. Uh, there was just one day before the agreement, and this is, of course, the timing was meaningful, I think, uh, one day before the uh, announcement of the Iran-Saudi agreement, there was this Wall Street Journal report about the list of the demands that uh, the Saudis had uh, you know, presented to the U.S., including security guarantees, including helping in the uh, development of their nuclear uh, program. So uh, these are, I think, uh, still on the table. The Saudis are uh, trying to uh, sell it uh, to the best offer. And right. uh, so there's still a lot of uncertainties, I think, in that sense. So when it comes to the role of China and this China-US dichotomy in the Middle East. It's very interesting. Before this agreement, uh, several commentators or so Middle East commentators were pretty much saying that, um, you know, there's just instability that they see in the future um, in the Middle East. And now they are all flipped. They now see it, well, it might be one of the most stable regions, actually. 
So it's, um, you know, w w would you agree with that, first of all? or uh, If there is just one role, one rule, sorry, in the Middle East, uh, it's uh, unpredictability. Right. And uh, the Middle East never stops to amaze uh, the observers and, uh, you know, the public in general. Uh, so in that sense, I think uh, we need to keep our uh, optimism uh, sort of uh, contained uh, in a way, because, uh, of course, uh, the Iran-Saudi uh, conflict, if you may say, uh, has been one of the main areas of uh, potential uh, tension, uh, like uh, kind of explosion uh, points, uh, potential explosion points uh, of the Middle East. But it's just one of them. Uh, the more important one is uh, still uh, the Iran-Israeli uh, conflict, for which I don't see still any sort of... Uh, you know, clear Solution. prospect for, yeah. for it uh, uh, to be resolved. Um, let me be actually a little bit uh, optimistic here. Okay. Uh, and uh, to, to say that depending on the role uh, China is going to play, that uh, issue can also be uh, somehow addressed. I'm not saying it's going to be solved, but somehow addressed because, again, uh, China, if you consider China's uh, sort of interest in uh, stability in the region and put it in the context of the initiatives, as I mentioned, uh, that the Chinese have already uh, uh, presented, uh, it means that they really want to do something about that. And again, it's only China which, uh, you know, has an actual leverage on Iran. It was Russia also, but now uh, the relationship has sort of reversed, you know, because it's Iran now providing drones to uh, to to Russia. So Iran's leverage over Russia is, uh, if not more, at least at the same level as the Russians. Uh, so I, I I really believe that China has the capacity, at least, uh, to push Iran and Israel towards some sort of modus vivendi, at least. And uh, I don't really uh, expect uh, any sort of normalization or even Iran coming out publicly accepting Israel as, as a state, as long as Islamic Republic is the Islamic Republic. And I'm quite clear about that because this is something tied to the core of the identity uh, of the Islamic Republic. The moment that Islamic Republic uh, you know, accepts Israel, uh, it, it's not Islamic Republic anymore. It's something else. And they don't want, especially as long as the clerics are there, they don't want this to happen. Because that's the ideology uh, upon which they have built the whole political system, the whole regime. Right. So that's not going to happen unless, uh, unless a fundamental change uh, in Iran happens. Either a regime change uh, towards a more democratically uh, sort of represented country or uh, some sort of uh, fundamental change uh, from within that would uh, push ideology uh, to the core. Uh, but as I said, uh, in terms of modus vivendi, that may uh, uh, happen. So uh, to sum it up, I would say it's still really uh, difficult uh, to see this as, uh, you know, sort of pushing the region uh, towards uh, a more peaceful uh, settlement uh, between uh, between different actors, but it shows that there is uh, the potential, and there are actors, or better to say, actor, the China here uh, with the capacity to do so.